Uh, throughout the book of Mark, we have this underlying question, who is Jesus? And it permeates throughout it. We, we saw last week how Jesus came to John the Baptist to be baptized in the Jordan River, though uh, Jesus really didn't need to be, and he does it to uh, submit to the will of God. And, and in that scene, we have the heavens opening up and a voice from heaven declaring that Jesus is God's Son. And even though we have this magnificent scene, we also know that not everyone witnessed it. And we also know that as Jesus interacted with people, they had this question, who is this guy? Mark, throughout his gospel, wants to communicate exactly who Jesus is. And so he gives us pictures of what Jesus does, and he tries to fill in this image for who Jesus is. Uh, the rest of chapter 1, we see Jesus calling the first four disciples, and we see Jesus begin his ministry of healing by healing a, a couple of different people. And the crowds begin to form, and, and there's lots of reasons for this. You know, Jesus is healing people, and in a world where medicine wasn't necessarily the best, there was a lot of, I mean, you, if you didn't know that you were going to be healed by the medicine you had, and you have this guy that's wanting to heal people, you're going to flock to him. And so a lot of people came to Jesus, and it got to the point where Jesus decided that he was going to leave the city. And he goes out into the wilderness, but despite going out into the wilderness, people still followed him. And so what we see in the book of Mark is a couple of stories after stories where Jesus does these miraculous things, and uh, there's amazement in response. People are amazed and awed at what Jesus is doing, and they ask this question over and over again, what does this mean? Who is this guy? Uh, what I want to do over the, uh, today is look at a couple of different stories where we see the amazement of the crowd and this question crop up over and over again. Uh, the first story I want us to look at is in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them up and follow along with us. Uh, we want to look and see how these people learned from the things that Jesus did. Uh, here's what it says, starting in verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home, and they gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and Jesus preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them, and since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the, mat, the man on the mat the mat the man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Uh, so Jesus comes back to town after going into the wilderness. And within the book of Mark, there's this uh, constant shift with Jesus between the wilderness and the city. And he comes, and I think he probably tries to keep it low key as he's coming into town. But as with any famous person, when they come to town, everyone knows about it and everyone goes to see him. And there's, there's two groups of people coming to see Jesus right now. All right, there, there's uh, what we're going to see, the teachers of the law, the scribes in the next verse. They're coming to Jesus because Jesus is beginning to get some traction. All right, people are starting to notice Jesus. And so these religious leaders, these scribes who knew the law of God, like the, knew the back of their hands, they had it memorized. All right, they are wanting to figure out where Jesus lands. Jesus, what are you exactly teaching? And then you have the other group of people, which is just the average Joe who is coming to see Jesus. And now they're not coming to bring their sick. They're coming to hear what Jesus has to teach them. You know, they're excited. They want to be a part of this movement in some way. For some of them, maybe they're just there because there's a crowd. Do you ever notice how crowds attract people? Maybe you're in high school and there was a crowd in the hallway and you went to see what was going on, right? Maybe it was a fight, maybe it was something else. I guarantee you if we went downtown today and we stood outside of Dave's shop and we all looked in the store and we're ooing and aahing, there would be cars that would stop to figure out what we were doing. Crowds attract 
people. And I think what happens is a small group of people come to Jesus to listen to him, and people see the crowd, and they just come, and more and more, and some of them can't even hear Jesus because he's in the house, and they're not, but they're there because of the crowd. And we're introduced to these four friends who have a friend who is paralyzed. Uh, Most likely this was a result of an accident, not that he was born this way. Uh, The handicapped in Jesus' day were not treated very kindly. Uh, Today we do a lot of things to help them out, and we're not perfect in any way, shape, or form, uh, but we do more than what they did. You know, they would often leave their handicap on the side of the road to beg because they didn't have enough money to take care of them themselves. And so everyone in the family was required to do something, even if that was begging. And so for this man to have four friends, it likely means that he wasn't always paralyzed, but something has happened and now he is. And so they're carrying Jesus to, they're carrying this friend to Jesus. And as they get to the house, they notice that there's no way that they're going to be able to get through that door. You know, no one's going to shift to let them carry their friend in. And so they go out to the back to where the stairs were and they climb up onto the roof and they find out where Jesus is. They probably can hear him through the roof and they start to dig. And I wonder whose idea that was or who had to repair it. And as they dig, they, they lower the mat down into Jesus and Jesus watches it all happen and he says to the man, your sins are forgiven. And that's interesting because this man can't walk, I wonder how much he was really concerned about his sins. You know, I think the expectation of the friends as they're lowering G- the man down is, Jesus, make him walk again, make him walk again, make him walk again, and suddenly they hear, your sins are forgiven. And I wonder what the shock went through there. But I think Jesus looks at the man and he knows that there's something more than just not walking that's, that's troubling this man. That this man is eat up on the inside because he is messed up in some way. And Jesus recognizes that and says, your sins are forgiven. Uh, Interestingly, in the Old Testament, there's this idea of a connection between our sins and physical ailments. Now, when we sin, there is often a physical side to that. And so I wonder if this man, as he's laying there day after day on the side of the street, thinks about the sins that he has and why he's in this position. And I wonder if it's just too much for him. And Jesus, recognizing that, addresses the most important need, which is forgiveness in his life. Well, not everyone in the crowd is excited about what Jesus has just said. We read uh, the rest of the story in verses 6 through 12, which says this. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, "Why, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And so he got up, took his mat, walked out in full view of them all, and this amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So the teachers of the law, they are there watching Jesus, and they have start to have this uh, theological debate in their heads and with Jesus. See, in the Old Testament, the only person that had the authority to forgive sins was God Himself. Uh, Once a year, the high priest would go in and he would sacrifice for the atonement of the sins of the people, and he would come out after doing that, and he would proclaim, your sins are forgiven, but in reality, the high priest was simply a spokesperson for God. God alone can forgive sins. And yet Jesus in this story looks at this man and says, your sins are forgiven, and it instantly causes a reaction amongst these scribes. Have you ever been in a conversation where you've said something that you knew made the other person mad? And maybe you didn't mean to make them mad, but you noticed on their face after smiling, they're now very serious. Their lips are pursed, and you can tell that you've upset them. They're shifting in their seats. 
And I picture this is what's happened. Jesus makes this comment, and suddenly there's a rustling sound behind him as the scribes all get rather uncomfortable at what Jesus has just said. And so Jesus turns to them and says, why are you having a problem? Why is this an issue for you? And he asks this question, which is easier to say? And it's a good question. Which is easier to say? That your sins are forgiven or get up? I mean, when we look at that question, we can answer that a little bit. It probably is slightly easier to say your sins are forgiven because how do you prove this? How can you tell that what he is saying is true? That, that's a hard one, right? Because we, we don't have the ability to truly forgive sins. God alone has that ability. And so if I say your sins are forgiven, how do I prove it? Whereas it's a little bit harder to say that get up and walk, you're going to be healed because it's instantly verifiable. Did the man get up? And so Jesus, in this discussion, says, I want to show you that I have this power. And so he says to the man, get up and walk. And by his actions, he proves that he can forgive sins. Jesus is powerful. And he's powerful enough to give radical forgiveness in your life. There's a lot of times in our lives where we just beat ourselves up after we've sinned because we know that what we have done has disappointed somebody and maybe it's ourselves maybe we're hiding our sins because we know that if our our family or our loved one knew what we did that they would be disappointed in us that we had let them down that we had broken relationships because of our sins and we can eat ourselves up time and time again And the thing that we really need in those moments is forgiveness. We need the forgiveness that only Jesus can give us. And Jesus is more powerful than the deepest sins that you have in your lives. And if you'll let Him, He can forgive you. Uh, The second story I want us to look at comes in Mark chapter 4, just a couple of chapters later. It's starting in verse 35. And we read about this amazing event taking place. Uh, Jesus has spent the entire day teaching the people, and the crowds had again gathered so thick that he had to get in a boat and push a little way off from shore and created this nice little amphitheater so that everyone could hear him. So we get to the end of the day, and we're told that as the day came, uh, as evening came, the, uh, he said to his disciples in verse 35, let us go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boats. And there were other boats with them, and a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? And so Jesus got up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And then we read about the reaction. They were terrified and they asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So Jesus, after this long day, decides that they're going to go to the other side, and he falls asleep because he's exhausted. And as they're going, we find this storm crops up. Uh, The uh, Sea of Galilee is in a basin, and it's kind of interesting how it all works. Uh, There's a wind tunnel in the south, southeast, that, that kind of causes the wind to just blow through, and suddenly these storms would appear without warning. Oftentimes they came in the day and early afternoon, and so you would see fishermen fishing on the Sea of Galilee at night. And so the disciples, as they're crossing this lake, they're doing it at night when there's not as much likelihood for a storm to appear. But a storm does appear, 
and it's a bad storm. And, and we can tell how bad it is by the reaction of the disciples. They are afraid for their lives. And remember that at least four of these disciples are professional fishermen. They spent most of their lives on this particular lake. And so they know how to handle sudden storms. And they themselves are afraid. And they go to Jesus and they wake him up and they say, Jesus, why are you still sleeping? And I think what they're wanting Jesus to do is grab an oar and help them along. Help us, Jesus. But Jesus does something different. He gets up and he rebukes the wind. Literally, he tells it to be muzzled. And we have this calming of the storm almost instantaneously. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, why are you afraid? And they're terrified. Now, not because of the storm, but because of Jesus. And they're asking the question, who is this guy? Jesus, in the midst of this chaotic situation, brings peace in the lives of his disciples. And there's a lot of times in our lives where it just seems to be out of hand, where chaos comes and we don't know what's going to happen next, and we don't know how we even feel about the situation, and we may even be afraid for our lives. And it's in those moments that we need Jesus to step in and give us peace. story in the Old Testament about David goes like this. He was looking out on his city one day, and he saw this beautiful woman who happened to be married. And even though he knew she was married, he committed adultery with this woman, and they had a child, a son. And the son became very sick, and David, for a week, for seven days, will pray to God, will fast, will beg God, please bring healing in this situation. And it was a chaotic moment in the mo life of David where he didn't know what was going to happen next, and he desired for his son to be healed, but his son eventually died. And when his son died, David got up and he went and he sacrificed to the Lord and he got bathed and he made himself presentable. And it was such a shift in what had happened that his servants come to David and said, David, why are you acting this way? And David says, it's because of God. And David, in the midst of the chaos of his life, of losing his son, finds peace because of God. And these disciples in the midst of this chaos of the storm finds peace because Jesus is powerful. He is more powerful than the storms that come into our lives. And if we will allow him, he can bring peace to our chaos. The next story I want us to look at is found in, in chapter 6 of Mark in verse 45. It's the second of the water miracles in the life of Jesus uh, it goes like this. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd, and after leaving them, he went up on the mountainside to pray. Uh, later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he, Jesus, was alone on land. And he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. And he was about to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought it was a ghost. And they cried out because they saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he climbed in the boat with them, and the wind died down, and they were completely amazed. This takes place right after the feeding of the 5,000. And what we read from the other gospel stories is that that feeding was a, was a moment where the people that were there wanted to make Jesus king. See, this area of, of Israel at that time was very nationalistic. They did not like Rome. And there was a lot of rebellions over the hundred years leading up to the life of Jesus where people in this particular region that he's at wanted to rebel against Rome and would fight and would often die. 
And so we have Jesus feeding 5,000 of these people who were ready for the Messiah, and they were ready to make Jesus king, and they were ready for the revolution right then and there, but Jesus was not. And so Jesus grabs his disciples and says, you guys head on back. And Jesus turns to the crowds and says, you guys need to go home. And Jesus goes up onto a mountain by himself to pray. And as he is there praying to his disciples, or praying to God, what are you doing, Tori? <laughs> as he's there praying to God, he looks out onto the sea and he sees his disciples struggling. And they are struggling against the wind. And they are trying to row back to shore. And Jesus sees that and he goes out to them by walking on the water. Uh, interestingly, in the Old Testament, the only person that's said to walk on the water is God. And so as he's doing this, they, they really aren't expecting it. We really wouldn't expect it either. It's also the pre-dawn light, and so they're not recognizing that it's Jesus. And the first thing that they think in their head is, this is a ghost, and they were terrified. Ghosts were pretty common superstition in that day, and remember that some of these guys are sailors who have their own brand of superstition as well. And so they're afraid because they don't know what is going on, and Jesus cries out to them and says, do not be afraid, take courage. It is I. Now, that's two words in the Greek. It's the God words, I am. And Jesus speaks and gives them courage in the midst of their fears. And I think the thing that the disciples were fearing in this moment was the fear of the unknown. Of not knowing what this was that was coming at them. And a lot of times in our lives, we fear the unknown as well. Now, the days are long. The disciples have spent all day ministering to people and all night rowing to shore, not quite getting there. And so they are tired and weak and they are afraid of what is about to happen. How often do we get afraid of what tomorrow is going to bring? How often are we afraid of how our kids are going to turn out? How often are we afraid about our job situation? How often are we afraid about that next bill that's going to be coming in the mail? And we're afraid because we don't know how we're going to make it to that next day. And Jesus is there, crying out, Do not be afraid because I am. And Jesus is powerful than our fears. He is more powerful than our fears, and He gives us courage to face tomorrow. The beauty in this story is that Jesus doesn't wait for the disciples to get to shore. Jesus sees their struggles, and He goes to them. And I promise you this, that Jesus sees your struggles, and He's coming to you to give you courage. Because Jesus loves you. In 1 John 4, 18, we read that there is no fear in love, but that perfect fear, love casts out fear. And we have a Jesus that loves us so perfectly that he wants to come and give us courage and cast out the fears of our lives, if we'll let him. The final story I want us to read is, comes from Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 31. Jesus, we're told, left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of the Decapolis. And there were some people who brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hands on him. And after he took him aside and away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears and he spit and touched the man's tongue. And he looked up into heaven and said with a deep sigh, uh, that word, uh, which means be opened. And at this, the man's ears were open and his tongue was loose. And he began to speak plainly. And Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear 
and the mute speak. Uh, this last story takes place in the Decapolis, a region of ten cities in a, Gal- or a Gentile region that included some Jews. And why Jesus is here, we don't necessarily know, but he is. And as he is there, they bring a man who is deaf, and literally his tongue is tied in a knot. He cannot speak well. And probably this man wasn't always this way, all right? but he is there now. And they come to Jesus and say, Jesus, will you lay your hands on him? And all they're asking is for Jesus to bless him. Uh, we would say, Jesus, pray for me. And so as Jesus is doing this, he brings the man to his side and he begins to do some weird things in our imagination. He puts his fingers in his ears and he spits and touches the man's tongue. Uh, Saliva in that day was thought to have medicinal purposes. And so this is why he's probably doing this, showing this man I'm about to do something good. And Jesus cries out to heaven, be open. And this man suddenly can hear and he suddenly can talk and everyone is amazed. We don't know this man's story, but I can imagine the pain in his life over losing his speech and over losing his hearing, of not being able to communicate with those you love dearly, and that would be a painful experience. And yet Jesus is more powerful than the pain in this man's life, and he brings healing to him. In our lives, there's a lot of things that are painful to us. You know, we have comments that people have said about us that just kind of sit on our shoulder and we just do not allow forgiveness to come into that relationship. You know, there's a lot of rejection that we receive, whether it's from our parents or from other people, and that rejection brings hurt into our lives. There's insecurities that we have because our peers at one point in time said something about us. There's a lot of abuse from those who we love and care for. And we go about this world with all this pain weighing us down. And then there's Jesus, who comes into this man's life who's hurting, and he brings healing. Jesus wants to open our ears. Jesus wants to have our tongues become untied. And he wants to bring healing into our lives because Jesus is more powerful than the pain that we have. The words at the end of this story, I think, are the most powerful where the people are amazed and wonder at everything that's going on. And they cry out that Jesus even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. And it's words from Isaiah chapter 35. The crowds are beginning to come to this conclusion about who Jesus is. And I think what Mark is trying to communicate to us is this. Jesus is more powerful than anything that we're going through. And Jesus is so powerful that he can defeat what it is that you are facing right now. Jesus is more powerful than the deepest sins that we have. Jesus is more powerful than the darkest fears that leave us cowering in our boats. Jesus is more powerful than the storms that we are facing in life. Jesus is more powerful than the hurts that we're carrying around. And if we'll let him, if we'll come to Jesus and take on his yoke and his burden. Jesus can defeat everything that we are going through. So come to Jesus, because Jesus is powerful. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for these stories of Jesus, these stories that show the power and might that is in Him. Lord, help us when we are dealing with these things of life that just come upon us. I pray, Lord, that we can trust in Jesus, that we can have the strength that He provides, that we can rely on Him to defeat these things because we are not able to. We don't have the power, but Jesus, He is powerful, and He will overcome, and we can have victory through His victory.
Thank you for that hope. It's your name we pray. Amen.